All right, in this video, we're going to look at arc length and curvature. This goes with section 3.3 .3 of the OpenStax textbook, Calculus Volume 3. In this video, we're going to try to learn about arc length for vector functions, curvature for vector functions, and the unit normal vectors. So you may want to do a little bit of review of arc length from Calc 1. There's this link here to that section of the Calc 1 textbook. Um, but the formula that you may have seen is if you had some function f of x, uh, then you could integrate the square root of one plus f prime of x squared, and you could get the arc length of that curve. Uh, well, if we replace f prime with dy dx and think of this arc length as some scalar s, we get this version of that same formula. And if we switch to uh, parameterization where x is a function of t, our parameter, uh, then the differential dx would be equal to x prime dt, just by using the chain rule. Uh, a and b are both points uh, for x values, and so there are specific t values, t1 and t2, that would go into the x function to give you a and b. And so if you want to write it in terms of the parameter t, you would need to go from t1 to t2, and you'd need to replace dx with dx dt over d, dx over dt times dt. So just substituting these formulas in here, we can rewrite this integral in terms of the parameter t. Uh, and then if you see the dx dt would come inside the square root, and it would be dx dt squared uh, inside the square root, and then it could multiply and you would get that I can show because when it distributes, it's going to hit this, and that would be dx dt squared because it's just times one. And then here it'd be dy dx squared times dx dt squared. And the dx's cancel, giving you dy over dt, which is y prime of t squared. So in terms of parametric equations, x of t and y of t, uh, for a parametric curve um, or and for a vector valued function, uh, our formula takes this form. Now this is in two dimensions, but you can easily extend it to three dimensions by just adding on a plus z prime of t squared inside the square root. So, uh, here it's written where uh, f and g are the component functions for a vector valued function r. Uh, we've been using uh, f and g instead of x and y. Um, so this just kind of puts it in terms of f and g. And in three dimensions, f, g, and h. So when you get the arc length, you just do the magnitude of this, right? That's what this is, is the magnitude of the vector function, which is the square root of the sum of the squares. Um, I guess it's the magnitude of the derivative though, right? Because these are the derivative components. And there you have it. Uh, the arc length uh, is the integral of the magnitude of the derivative of the vector function. Uh, and the way you calculate that is you take derivatives of the components, f, g, and h, uh, and then you do the square root of the sum of the squares of those derivatives. And then you integrate. <laughs> So uh, derivatives, uh, magnitude or distance formula, and then integration all in one. Here's an example with a specific vector valued function. First component, t cosine t. Second component, t sine t. Third component, 2t. So just take the derivative of each component, and then you do the square root of the sum of the squares. Now, in general, if I just made up some function, this could look really bad, and I wouldn't know how to integrate it. But you'll see a lot of cosine and sine in here. And then there's a lot of magic with cosine squared plus sine squared going to one. And, and like with this problem, a lot of stuff simplifies. It ends up just being square root of t squared plus five. Um, and you can actually then calculate that integral. Um, that's not trivial though. It's pretty difficult still. You have to use a table or some more complicated integration techniques, but you can calculate the integral uh, exactly here and then approximate it. So when we do this, we actually get a constant, right? Because it is just the length of a curve. So it is a fixed constant number. It's not a function of t um, because we're going from a to b. 
Um, but you could go from some starting point that's fixed at A to some variable ending point T. And if you do that, if you put your T here, you can't use T down here. So you use a dummy variable like U uh, and then integrate this. Um, and then this should remind you of fundamental theorem of calculus part one, where this ends up coming out to be uh, a function of T. Now it's not just gonna undo the derivative because this is the magnitude of the derivative, um, but it will end up giving you arc length as a function of T uh, from some starting point A. So you may also see this written as an arc length function instead of just a constant. When we talk about curvature, you want to think about moving along a curve and how sharp the turns are. Um, you could actually think of maybe driving along this curve, say this was a road, and, and as you make uh, a turn, you would think of the circle that would kind of best fit in that curve. And the radius of that circle um, is inversely proportional to the curvature. Uh, that means as the radius gets bigger, the curvature gets smaller, and as the radius gets smaller, the curvature gets bigger. So a high curvature means it's a very sharp turn, right? Um, now, when we calculate curvature, well, I guess the symbol first, the symbol is Greek letter kappa, lowercase kappa, it looks kind of like a K with some squiggly lines. Um, and it's defined as the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent vector, well, the principal unit tangent vector with respect to the arc length S. Um, so this is the official definition, but it's not very practical because when we get big T here, this principal unit tangent vector, it's usually a function of little t, the parameter, and not the, the uh, arc length. So this isn't a very workable definition, but this is the official definition. Um, and remember when we did find unit tangent vectors, we had to do the derivative divided by its magnitude. Uh, well, that could be pretty complicated, right? because of the magnitude being the square root. And so if I picked something with just pretty simple polynomial component functions, uh, if that square root doesn't simplify, then I get something pretty messy like this. Uh, and now we still need to do a derivative and we need to do a magnitude of that and it could get pretty out of hand, right? So you'll see a lot of kind of contrived examples that allow you to work through this process. But uh, in general, this is very uh, computationally uh, demanding. So some alternative formulas that we might actually use to find the curvature, uh, there are three of them. And you may have seen this bottom one because it's just written in terms of y being a function of x. So if the curve is just y is a function of x and you know y, y double prime, uh, and you can find those easily, then you may just want to use this one um, in, in the non-calculus sense. But if you have vector valued functions, then you really have two options, right? Uh, this one and this one. And uh, you can see they both involve uh, the vector function r and its derivatives and magnitudes. This one has a cross product. Um, this one has the unit tangent vector function. So we'll see how to get those, uh, how to choose which one and, and, and how to calculate those in the uh, methodology. Now I mentioned how to get the tangent vector. Uh, that was the big T function, right? So this is the t unit tangent vector. Well, this is its derivative, but the big T is the unit tangent vector. Um, but as you're moving along, you may also want to know what the unit normal vector is. And then if you take the cross product of the tangent and the normal, um, then you get sort of a, a little moving frame of reference, a three-dimensional basis. And that third uh, axis is your binormal. Uh, and so these kind of make a right-handed triple, like x, y, z axes that move with the curve. And this is known as the Fernet frame of reference. Uh, so if you do have the principal unit tangent vector, then you can get the unit normal vector in a similar process to the tangent vector, where take the derivative and then make it a unit vector. Um, recall that that's what we did basically with, with R to get T, right? So T came from R prime of T as a vector over magnitude. Sorry, magnitude of r prime of t. 
So take the derivative, divide by the magnitude to make it a unit vector. Same thing with t, you do it a second time to get the normal vector. Um, now to get the binormal, you just do the cross product of the tangent and the normal. So getting that binormal can be really tough. Here's an example, uh, our original function r, some pretty simple component functions, linear, quadratic, linear. And uh, here we find the unit, principal unit tangent vector, which again, we'll probably drop principal and just call it the unit tangent vector function. Um, and you can see that we do luck out and get this to be pretty simplified, even though it does have one over square root of t squared plus one in it. That square root in the denominator is kind of unavoidable because you're dividing by the magnitude, right? Um, from there, we may want to go to the binormal, and so we'll need the derivative of t, which we can calculate here and isn't that bad. Uh, and then we need the magnitude of that derivative, which looks really bad and then just lucks out to simplify to something pretty simple, one over t squared plus one. So when you get lucky with this part of it, uh, then you can actually divide these two and you can get the unit normal vector. So it's not that bad in this case. And so there are some problems where you can calculate this by hand. Uh, if you want to then go on to the binormal, you do need to do the cross product of the principal unit tangent vector function with the unit normal tangent vector, <laughs> the unit normal vector function. Um, and we do that in the same way we did vector cross products before with the matrix that has i, j, k in the first row and then the first vector in the second row and the second vector in the third row. And then this one works out to have a nice constant vector for its binormal. All right. So with these concept check questions, we're just checking to think about which curvature formula you might use uh, if you were given the following. So say I was just told that the curve is defined by f as a function of x. Um, and I want to know what the curvature is when x is equal to 2, right? So can I pick a specific point on the curve to find the curvature? All right, so you should have been drawn to answer choice D, because we said that was the one you would use if you had just a regular old function from calc 1 or pre-calculus. I guess this is calc 1 because it has derivatives. But there's no vector function here, right? So we wouldn't use A through C. What about this vector here, the red arrow that's drawn there? What is that vector? We should have identified that as the normal vector. Uh, the tangent vector would be along this line here, tangent to the curve, and then at a right angle to that is the normal vector. And then the binormal would be sticking out of the screen at you because it's the cross product of these. Right, and that is it. Uh, again, this presentation by Matthew Watts contains images and texts from Calculus Volume 3 by Jed Herman and G. Strange, uh, published by OpenStack CC by NCSA.